we got some good stuff this morning. Um, <clears throat> just in light of what I just shared about the great <coughs> commandment and the great commission, the reason why I wanted to share this this morning with you guys, I know we've hit it out in the past, um, I read a quote this week by a guy named Mike Brin, and he said this, listen carefully, have we shifted our criteria for good disciple, for a good disciple as someone who shows up for our stuff, gives money, or occasionally feeds the poor? And that kind of hit me, because for us to be followers of Christ, it's about discipleship. That's something that we are to grow in, to go deep in, to be more and more like him. It's not like, oh, I just hope people show up today. And I pray because really, church, why are we here? We find encouragement, right? We get to be with other brothers and sisters. We're going to be taught the word of God, which is going to equip us for the work of ministry. It's going to reveal more of who our God is, what he's like, his heart, and if we're going to be more like him, those things are needed. Those things are good. And I want to go deep with you guys. You guys know I love the word of God, and you know that I believe what the word says about itself. Okay? It radically can transform a person's life. Okay? It can get us into a place that we have right thinking. And that is so important, especially when it comes to what we believe. Okay? And you guys know that doctrine matters. Okay? We're told in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all of Scripture, the whole of the Bible, okay, it's God-breathed, it's inspired by him, and it's been given to us for four different things, but the first thing that he names is for doctrine, to teach us what is right. And we need to know what's right, because if we have bad doctrine, you know what that's going to do? It's just going to have us in a place of having bad thoughts or thinking about other things. Like bad theology begets more bad theology. We see that happen all the time. And that's where we're called in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study to show yourselves approved to God, workmen that don't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So doctrine matters. And as we've been studying verse by verse through Genesis and Romans this last year, we're about to embark in some chapters that have a lot of controversy on how to interpret it, how to look at it, what is God actually speaking about? Israel, <laughs> what's the deal here? We're going to get into chapters 9, 10, and 11. But before we do that, I wanted to take some time and look biblically at what God has to say concerning Israel. So we're going to do that the next two weeks here. Um, and why does it matter? Um, because it matters to God. And first of all, I want you guys to know that this morning... This is not a political message that I'm giving today. Sometimes when we are in the word of God, okay, it will have political implications because it is truth and it will speak to what's going on in our lives culturally, okay? But this is strictly biblical and the purpose is through it is to help us navigate to understand current political happenings in the Middle East, in the world from a biblical world view. And that's something that I really pray that we here at Freedom are going to do because don't we want a biblical worldview, okay? The world has a whole lot to say. Culture's telling us a whole lot of things and what to care about. And we know that Jesus said that the cares of this world, they're gonna choke us out. But he came to give us life and life abundantly. He came to bear witness to the truth and that truth, as we're told in John 8, 32, will set us free. So when we are looking to the scriptures first, and we have a biblical view, we're able to look at things going on in the world today rightly, with right understanding. But that often gets flip-flopped in Christendom today, because we're looking at all the stuff, and how do we fit scripture according to what we want, what we're seeing, you know, that's backwards. So this morning... God has much to say when it comes to specifically Israel and why Israel matters. Now, some of you guys are already wanting to check out, Whoa, I'm a Gentile believer, okay? I'm not a Jew. I live in the West. Israel's way over there. Who cares? Well, I'm going to share with you guys 
because scripture actually says much about this. A guy by the name of Lewis uh, Sperry Schaefer, he says five, six of the Bible bears directly or indirectly on Israel and the Jews. Now, if that much of the Bible, <laughs> five, six of it, come around to Israel and the Jewish people, do you think maybe God cares about Israel and the Jewish people? And do you think as followers of Jesus Christ, if that's what he cares about, maybe we should care about it too? Maybe we should have some good doctrine, teaching, theology around Israel, okay? So this morning, guys, we're going to really dive in and consider how we as Christians, as believers of the Messiah, okay, who is Jewish, Jesus, um, how are we to view Israel, okay? How are we going to look at the challenges of her existence, you know, how do we look at the possession of the land itself there in Israel and her chances of survival? So those are some of the things we're going to cover this morning. So there were and there are and there always will be when we consider Israel, they're always going to be God's chosen people. If I could have you guys look up, oh, real quick, I got to go to Israel last year with some of you guys that are here. Woo-hoo! It was awesome. Um, I'm not showing a lot of pictures. This is the only picture. Sorry about that guy that's in the middle. But if you look beyond him, behind, that's Megiddo, guys. That's where Jesus um, translated, you know, that's the Hebrew, uh, Megiddo, Armageddon. Have you guys heard of Armageddon? This is where Jesus is going to return the second time and wage war, and we're coming back with him. I'm pretty excited. Um, for that. But anyways, uh, what I want to share with you guys, we're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning um, because the Bible says much about Israel and why it matters. Uh, so you note takers, you're going to love this morning's sermon. Okay, the first one we're going to look at is found in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Okay, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. He's speaking to Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. So you guys catch that. Israel matters because God has chosen her, okay? He's done that. We also know that she is the firstborn of the Lord. Uh, We're told here in Jeremiah 31 verse 9, they shall come with weeping. And supplications, I will lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And then a scripture that I love more than any other concerning God's heart for Israel is found in the prophet Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches what? The apple of my eye. Do you guys know that Israel is the apple of God's eye? So there are four things we're going to dive into in this study of why Israel matters. Okay, And it's going to help us have a scriptural understanding okay, of Israel. We're going to look at God's purposes for Israel. We're going to look at God's promises to Israel. And then we're going to look at the preservation next week of Israel and also the prophecies of Israel. And that's going to be really hard for me not to go to this morning because when you consider Israel and all the promises that God's made to her, we're seeing Bible prophecy about Israel being fulfilled right before our eyes today and that's pretty exciting but we'll get into that deep dive next Sunday but I want to give you guys a heads up Um, I'm also going to be refuting replacement theology as we're going through this study because it is something that much of the church of Jesus okay in Christendom has embraced and it is horrible theology which I said before begets more bad theology and I can't think of a denomination okay, um, that follows, has bought in to the lie of a replacement theology. And what I mean by replacement theology is they teach that Christians, the church, have replaced Israel, okay? We took their place because Israel 
the Jews rejected their Messiah, Jesus. So God said, hey, I'm done with them. And now you Gentiles, the church, you guys get to have all the promises and blessings of Israel. You're going to replace them. That's completely unbiblical, okay? And again, bad theology begets more bad theology. And when I look into writings, commentators, different movements, tribes, (laughs) denominations that have bought into that lie, there's a lot of other bad theology that accompanies it because of their view of Israel and what God says to her. And it's very easy to start twisting Scripture and looking at things wrongly. And we guys, we want to have a proper systematic theology when we approach the Scriptures. Okay, Hermeneutics, like we're going to be jumping into chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans and everyone who has a hermeneutic is an interpretation how they go about studying and interpreting the scriptures. A lot of these guys, when they come to those chapters, they throw out how they've interpreted the rest of scripture when they come to those chapters. And it's just like, oh, what? you can't do that. <laughs> and if we, if we don't do that, <laughs> we're, we're, we have to believe what God says in his word. And I want us here at Freedom to know that we can believe, literally believe what he says. We don't have to twist it. We don't have to make it say something else because of some presupposition that we have. We can receive just what he is saying as he said it. And there is a safety in that. And I've been able to preach over 3,000 sermons, okay? The entirety of the Bible except for the book of Ezekiel. There's just some stuff in there I'm still like, I'm sure. But the whole of, it works. You can literally read and trust what God has said in his word. So we're going to do a deep dive. We're going to look into the purposes this morning that God has in Israel. And I want us to mark down five things, you know, specifically why God chose Israel. The first one we're going to look at is found in Genesis chapter 12, which we have been able to study in depth this last year. The first one is that through Israel, God might bless all nations. Think about the implications of that and what that means for you and I. We're told in Genesis 12, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. Precious promise right there. Is God faithful to his promises? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, If I would ask you guys, what is the most, you know, prosperous nation, most blessed nation of all time, what would you guys say? America. America, okay? Why is that? Well, it's because of this verse. Those who bless you, I will bless. Do you guys know that the United States is the only country that stands with Israel on a consistent basis? We are the only ones. So if this is God's word, if this is a promise of his, and we look around and say, why have we been so blessed? I think it's because of Genesis 12 promise here. That's it, guys. Okay? We come to her side. We come to her aid. We have her back. I think that's pretty cool. So another thing that we read in Scripture, that through Israel, God might demonstrate his faithfulness. Okay? Okay? Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 9, For you are holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, And because he would keep an oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and has redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh the king. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is the God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep 
his commandments. All right, on to number three. We see here that through Israel, God might teach all the nations about himself. Through Israel, he's going to do this. You guys catching this? Isaiah 43, the prophet tells us in verses 10 to 12, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you, Israel, know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me there is no Savior. Got that in verse 11? No Savior but God alone. And I declared and saved and have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. So through Israel, guys, all the nations are going to know about God because they are the ones who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's name, as we saw last week in Genesis, was changed to Israel, okay? It's going to be through them. I want to give a shout out real quick, okay? I don't know if you guys get friend requests on Facebook. I get them, and I don't friend anybody unless I actually know them. And I got a friend request yesterday from a guy by the name of Elder uh, Matthew Millett. There we go. Well, the only reason I looked is because he's hitting up a bunch of my friends. I'm like, is this a guy I am to know? And he sent me a message, okay? He's a Mormon missionary here in the valley. And I'm like, why are all my friends friends with this guy? Well, he left me a message. And I'm like, oh, he's trying to evangelize me, okay? So he left a message just saying, hey, I love the scriptures, okay? Love talking about them. Love Jesus, you know? Want to get together and talk. You know, you know where my head went immediately? right to this passage that there is no Savior but God. You're saying Jesus is your Savior, but you don't believe Jesus is God. So you're calling God a liar because God alone is Savior, we're told. And if you don't believe that my Savior, Jesus Christ, is God, we're going to have some problems. Why am I bringing that up this morning? Because I saw you guys are friends with this person. Don't be duped (laughs) by the Mormons, okay? They worship another Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible, okay? Jesus is God, the creator of all things, okay? He alone is Savior. The the Trinity is legit. Jesus is the only way, and their Jesus is some other Jesus. So be very careful with Elder Millet, okay? All right, if you're watching Elder Millet... The Jesus of the Bible loves you and died for you, and he's God. Um, Yeah, we read all that. Let's go on to the fourth one. Oh, yeah, you guys can study, too, what the Mormons believe about Israel. Replacement theology really begets bad theology, okay? That's why we got to trust God. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Here's a bonus. You guys can write this down. Uh, Know all things. All these things happened to them, speaking of Israel's examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So there is much, again, the Bible speaks about, but they have written, these things have been put down that we would learn. And some of you guys are thinking, why are we doing this study this morning as Gentile believers? Because we have much to learn, and most of all, the heart of our God. Okay, He has a heart for Israel, and we're going to see that as we continue on. Look at number four here. Through Israel, God might be praised, okay? Uh, Isaiah 43 again, this time verse 20 and 21. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, and uh, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. So this people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise so it's through god's people that he might be praised okay and the world has a hard time with that you guys you jews okay you worship the god of who of abraham isaac and jacob do you guys know that's the god we worship okay we honor i'd say the muslims have such a hard time with them because they don't worship that god they worship a different god so but this is how god might be praised And then the fifth one we're going to look at together this morning is that through Israel, salvation might come to you. Check out what 
Jesus says here to a woman he encountered who wasn't a Jew in John chapter 4. He says in verse 21, he said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You will worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So our Lord and Savior made it pretty clear there concerning Israel. Do you guys know that the oracles were given, the precious promises were given to Israel? Okay? Jesus came to his own first. Do you guys know that Jesus was a Jew? Oh, no, he was black. No, he was not black. Okay? And I can't stand all the art we have. Jesus wasn't a white dude. He was Jewish. You guys understand that? He was a Jew. He came to his own. Okay? A Jew is the Savior of the world. Okay? So, it is through Israel that we get to realize the blessings of God, the faithfulness of God. We get to learn the character of God. We get to see that God is praised through them and that salvation is made through them. Okay? It was through Abraham's seed that the Savior of the world, the Messiah, would come. So if then God did not fulfill his promises, think about this with me, this covenant that he made with Israel, then there would be no blessing for the nations, correct? There would be no, you know, God would prove to be unfaithful. Also, we would learn that he is a promise-breaking, unpredictable God. That sounds more like Allah than Yahweh, okay? Okay. Therefore, God would not be praised according to his character, and you cannot have a sure hope in salvation. We're told in Philippians 1, 6, that we can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Because <laughs> if God did not cast off Israel, he's not going to cast off, he's faithful even when we're unfaithful. Do you guys know that Israel's been quite unfaithful over the years? But he has still been faithful, and he's going to be faithful to you. Then we have no reason, if he did cast off Israel, if the church has replaced Israel, like many churches, pastors, teach, believe, okay, then we can conclude he might do the same thing with us. We have no security. He just might cast us off too then right? So have you been more faithful than Israel? Are you more deserving? Guys, it's God. It's all God. So yet, for most Christian history, the church has taught that God abandoned Israel and the Jews because they rejected the Messiah. And even though the New Testament clearly states concerning Israel and the Jews, which we're going to get into shortly, Romans chapter 11, check out verse 2 with me here. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Could the apostle be any clearer? He is not done with Israel. He tells us not to ignore Israel. We can't do that. For I am also an Israelite, he said, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. So remember, his very purpose in choosing Israel was to demonstrate his faithfulness, not ours, okay? It's all about him. In Isaiah 49, verse 14 and 15 and 16, it says, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Pretty cool verse, huh? Who was that written to? It's to Israel, okay? It was Israel. A lot of us, oh, he wrote my name on the palm of his hands. No, you're a Gentile believer. He's speaking to Israel here. I mean, it's a cool picture, but this promise was to Israel. So it teaches the church about the heart of God. And when we buy into bad theology, replacement theology, we're missing the heart of our God. We're missing parts of his character. We're misrepresenting him. 
So how are we to think of God if he said such a thing and then later cast her off? You see, he chose Israel that through her he might be praised. So what praise is there if he made promises and then just cast her off? There would be none, but God is faithful. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37 tell us this. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for the light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and the waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, I have, or if heaven above can be measured, the foundations of earth search out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So he chose to reveal salvation through Israel. So how can we be sure that he will save us if he can't save his firstborn, the apple of his eye? Okay? He has. He's been faithful. His word is true. We can trust him. Isaiah again, chapter 62. This time it says, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. And you shall be also a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God, and you shall no longer be termed forsaken. Nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephazibah, in your land Bula. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you, and your bridegroom rejoices over the bride. So shall your God rejoice over you. And I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You shall make mention of the Lord. Do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. Pretty cool. God's not done with Israel, guys. And do you know when Jesus does return, he's going to rule and reign on this planet for 1,000 years from where? From Jerusalem. Okay, God is not done with Israel. So he's still the apple of his eye, and those who claim to be after God's own heart, Christians, Isn't our desire? We want to follow Jesus, his disciple. We had better, you know, be right when it comes to his view, his heart, how he sees Israel. So there is a different program when we talk about national Israel opposed to the church and scripture. And the only way salvation can come is through the Messiah, okay? Whether you're a Jew or a Greek, Jesus is Savior, Okay, it is through faith in him you get saved. But God has uniquely worked with Israel nationally differently in the past and even in the future. Do you guys know that there is a time coming, great tribulation? Okay, God is going to be working different during that time. I read chapters 6 to 19 in Revelation. Man, Israel goes through it. God is dealing with Israel specifically during that time and i'm still looking for the verse to show that the church is even there we here at freedom believe in the rapture of the church okay we're going to be taken out before god's wrath comes well the church is not even mentioned one time during the great tribulation where are we why is god working differently with us than with israel well that's the way it is okay he has a special plan and purpose in dealing with his own people And we even see that shaking out today. Them just even even back in the land, okay? There's things happening. 
Anyways, we're going to talk much more about that next week. But a little background now, okay, as we look at God's promises to Israel. And I want to take a look again at Genesis 12 with you guys. I know we did a deep dive into this passage of Scripture. But just to recap, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they acquired in Haran, and they had departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, and Abram passed through the land to a place of Shechem, as far as the Terebith tree of Morah. And then the Canaanites went then in the land, and then catch verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord and or who had appeared to him. Guys, this is what we call the Abrahamic covenant. God made a covenant with this man, Abram. So it's given to him and also who? His descendants. Okay? So there are four basic components when we look at this passage of Scripture that we have to catch and recognize. One promise that was made is that they would be a great nation. Did you guys see that in verse 2? They would be a great nation. There's 6.8 million Jews returned to their homeland today. Okay, You look back 100 years ago, hardly anybody lived there. Okay, and The Jews themselves, they were dispersed all over the world. So the second thing that we've got to catch here is that God would give his protection and covering, as we're told in verse 3. So that would be past, present, and future. I think even during the tribulation, when things are going crazy over there, okay, he's going to preserve 144,000 Jews, right? Going to protect them uh, from all that war. Uh, verse 3, or sorry, the third point here is the blessing for all nations that we see in verse 3. And of course, that's speaking of Jesus, right? The Messiah, the Savior of the world. And fourthly, guys, the land of Canaan itself that we saw in verse 7, the promised land. So there is a geographical Israel, okay? Um, Let's look at another passage from Genesis, this time chapter 15, verse 18. It says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Your descendants I give, have given the land from the river of, of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay, so there is geographical land there. It is amazing. Uh, for you guys who went on the trip with me last year, I was kind of in awe when we were on the northern part of, of Israel. Okay, uh, we saw a fence, okay? Jordan was on the other side, and here's Israel. And you look down the other side of the fence to the, this other country, and it's desert, it's dirt, it's gross, and Israel is green. Read the end of Amos. God promised to do this in the last day, to have his people return, okay? And that they would be producing fruit. There would be an overflow, and it is today, guys. It's unbelievable this little country, what it's doing, and how many millions of people live there now. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Prophecy next week, guys. <laughs> so, um, and this is an everlasting covenant. Did you guys catch that? Israel's important because this is everlasting. Genesis 13, 15 says, For all the land which you see I have given to you and your descendants, catch it, forever. How does replacement theology work out if this is a covenant that God has made forever, everlasting? There's not going to be an end to it. And then chapter 17, which I also have up here for you guys, verse 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, 
I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Everlasting. It's crazy. They're there today in the land, okay? And the Palestinians, the, the Middle East, they won't even put her on the map. They don't want to recognize her. But God has made this promise. They are there today. They are on the map, whether or not they want to recognize it. And that's why there's all these tensions and war going on. It's over the land. Well, if they're not really there, why are you fighting with them all the time? It's crazy. Anyways, we know that this covenant was confirmed. Okay, it was with Isaac, the son promised to Abraham. We read of that in Genesis 26. Verse 3, dwell in the land and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform an oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So there, okay, hey, Abraham, your son Isaac, get it. This is going to come through you. It's to your descendants also. And then also to Jacob, who is Isaac's son. And we saw that in Genesis 28, verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And you and your seed, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken. So the covenant that God had made with Abraham concerning the promised land of Israel was dependent solely upon Israel. God, do you guys see what God is declaring? It is his deal. It wasn't a, you know, if, then kind of scenario. It was God alone was going to do this. So another scripture we find in Genesis 15 this time. Look at verse 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and I will give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a horror, great darkness fell upon him. And then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will be afflicted 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kezanites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraim and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershites, and the Jebusites. So please notice, Christian, this covenant, okay, by which you are saved, okay? It is through Israel that the blessing of the Messiah would come. It was Jesus, a Jew, a descendant of Abraham's, who hung on that cross 2,000 years ago to forgive the sins of the world. And that, guys, the forgiveness of our sins, that was solely God also. Do you understand this? He chose Israel. (laughs) He made this covenant. He did it all. 
He did all the saving on that cross 2,000 years ago. You guys kind of getting the point? This is God's deal, okay? I love what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So understanding then this covenant that he made with Abraham being an everlasting covenant and that responsibility for the fulfillment, uh, it is of God alone, okay? It makes us all the sense in the world then that he would currently be working with Israel, right? Everlasting covenant. They're going to continue the land forever. We should be like, yeah, should be happening. Think about it. There's never been a people group in the history of the world that has disbanded from their homeland and made it more than three generations. Even though the Jews weren't in the land, there may have been a few, but just 100 years ago, there were Jews all over the world. 2,000 years after the dispersion of 70 AD. 2,000 years, there are still Jews. That's never happened with any other people group. Amazing. So, God is currently working today. So, if we think about it, his word and his character really are at stake here. If the church has replaced Israel... (laughs) It skews the character of God. It misrepresents him. He's not faithful to his promises any longer. See, God did promise that he would discipline by removing the children of Israel from the land in their persistent disobedience. I want to share from you Deuteronomy 28, verse 63. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to to do you good, and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. And you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from the end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known wood and stone. And among those nations... You shall find no rest, for, or nor shall the sole of your foot uh, have resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, in anguish of soul. And guys, this happened three times. 722 B.C. You guys remember the Syrians took the children of Israel into captivity. And then again, 605 B.C., Daniel, Jeremiah, the Babylonian captivity. And then 70 AD with the Romans, just as Jesus said was going to happen. But there was also promises given in the scriptures that they would be restored back to the land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 with me, verse 3 and 4, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. So he brought him back from the Assyrian captivity. He brought him back from the Babylonian captivity. And guess what, guys? He's bringing him back from the Roman captivity of 70 A.D., Almost 7 million Jews. You guys know today we have Jews. There's people I've talked to here who are Jewish. And they're like, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I need to move to Israel. I've never even been there as a Jew, but I just need to move there. Millions of Jews from all over the world are returning to the homeland. No one can explain why. It's just happening. We know why. Because God said he was going to do it. And it's so cool I learned when we were on our Israeli trip 
that if a Jew does return to the land, they don't need to find a job for a whole year. Just come. We will provide a place for you. We're going to take care of you. You come and you learn the language. You learn the lay of the land. (laughs) Just come. It's been so cool. Um, But God's been faithful to have his people return to this region that is called Palestine today. Do you guys know why they call it Palestine? Because the Romans utterly wanted to just dismiss the Jews altogether. Just write her out of record. So they named it Palestine. Well, it is Israel. The land is there, and the Jewish people are in the land today. Kind of exciting. God is faithful to his promises. Eternal possession. Think about it. So cool. Jeremiah 31, 36. In those ordinances, depart before me, says the Lord. Then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. And so coupled with this promise is the expectation, guys, of being restored to the land. And there was an amazing prophecy that we find tucked away in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8. Look closely at this, guys. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. You guys know that at midnight in 1948, May 14th, Israel was born in one day. Wow. Prophecy fulfilled. One day. How does that happen? It's because God did it. And you guys can look at their history, even recent history, since 1948. The wars they've fought and the supernatural protection upon them Okay? They have experts who've studied these different wars and what went down, the numbers that they were up against. There's no way. God intervened, guys. This is what I am doing. Okay? Becoming a nation in one day. Amazing. Anyways, after 2,000 years of being dispersed among the nations, the Jews have returned to the promised land. Jeremiah 32, you can jot down, verses 37 to 41. God says, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and my great wrath. And I will bring them back to this place. And I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart, one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. I will make the everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from doing them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in the land with all, catch it, my heart and with all of my soul. That's pretty cool for God to say about something. And he's saying it about who? The Jewish people. I've promised I'm going to bring you back, guys. I'm going to do this awesome thing with you. So how should a Christian feel about Israel? I am glad you guys asked. Do you guys feel like this maybe matters, that maybe we should get this? Absolutely. And it's a shame so much of the church ignores Israel today because Israel matters to God, and it should matter to us. Well, your Bible tells you that, the, that Israel is a portrait of God's faithfulness, that he has chosen her, that he calls her the apple of his eye. Uh, He says that he would sooner let the sun and the moon depart than forsake them. You see, the Bible tells us exactly how we are to feel and how we should respond. Look at Jeremiah 33 now, verse 7, 8, and 9. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return And I will rebuild the places as the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. And check out verse 9. Then it shall be to, to me a name of joy, of praise, and of honor before all the nations of the earth. Who shall hear all the good that I do to them? And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. Joy, praise, 
the glory for the Lord. And that's what's happening today. The world's looking on. How is this taking place? What is going on with Israel? How are they so blessed? How is there so much prosperity? Only God could do this, guys. To him be the glory. So the Lord's not done with Israel. And there's much to talk about. And we're going to get into a lot of that next week. But I want to close just with a couple of things I want us to consider. And one of those things is what Jesus told us in Matthew 24. Verses 6 and 7, he said, hey, you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. This is going on today, guys. Okay? See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. And then if we jump down to verse 33, Jesus says, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Okay? And we're seeing these things happen today. I mean, it's hard to turn on the news and not see, you know, somebody plotting and worrying and trying to bomb Israel. I love their Iron Dome, okay? <laughs> it's just crazy. They had the Arabs just, I think it was about a month ago, firing like crazy. I don't know how many thousands of missiles were fired, you know? It's just, there's constantly, they want to destroy Israel, do away with her. And it's going on all the time. And there, God is being faithful, protecting her. And we see these things happening. They have returned to the land. You know, we believe we're living in the last days. And I want to share one more passage of Scripture. It's a little bit longer. And it's in Ezekiel. I told you guys, I, it's the one book in the Bible I haven't taught through. There are some passages that are clear a day. Like, oh, that's exactly what you're talking about. There's some other passage in Ezekiel. It's like, what are you talking about, Jesus? <laughs> and I, I don't get this. But anyways, this one is very clear concerning Israel. God working for his sake and his name. Okay, in light of Israel. Check this out in chapter 36, verses 16 to 24. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, there was, or their way was like uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them, for the blood that had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallow, hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. This is God's deal. Guys, Israel is there for the glory of God, for his namesake, okay? I hope we have a better grasp, a little more clarity to the importance of Israel and why she matters and God's heart towards her. We're exhorted in Scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's something we should be doing as Christians, okay? We're also told in the New Testament we provoke Jews with jealousy why? Because we also worship and love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're looking at us Gentile, like, what are you, that's our God. Stop worshiping my God. You know, we get to provoke them. It's Jesus, a Jew. He's the Savior of the world. He was the promised Messiah. He's the blessing to all 
nations, and we get to provoke them. And I want to conclude just with one more thing, because here in the West, okay, uh, we don't always recognize the tensions that are going on around Israel, because that's way over there. But if we turn on the news, you're going to, even though it's a little country, the eyes of the world are on her. Okay, we're told in Zechariah that in the last days, Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling to all nations. Okay, so we have that reality. But for us as believers, I just want to I want to add this because here in our own backyard, in the valley in which we live, we have about two thousand Muslim families. Muslims look at us as you Christians. You love Israel, and how can we not? God loves Israel. Okay. <laughs> that's his heart. We're going to love them. But God died for the Muslim on that cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. He died for the sins of the world. That includes Arabs, the Muslim, all us Gentiles. That's what we have in common with the Muslims, guys. We are also Gentiles, also in need of forgiveness, in need of a Savior. And we get to share the good news with them. So I would encourage you guys, yes, we love Israel. We'd love to take trips to Israel. We pray for Israel. But let's be praying for the Muslims of the world. All this stuff that we see shaking out in the middle. Like, we got the Afghanistan thing happening right now. And we're like, man, shame on us. We blew it. What a mess, right? This kind of stuff has been happening my entire life in the Middle East. It's always something. And we look at it and we point the finger, well, that's Allah for you. That's the fruit of Islam. Wars, killing each other, wanting to take out Israel, killing the great Satan, America. They want to get up, you know. It's easy to do that. But the reality is God loves the Arab world. God loves the Taliban that took over in power. I don't know if you guys have been praying for that situation. My biggest prayer in all of that, and there's a lot of prayers that have come around everything going on in Afghanistan but the prayer that keeps coming up over and over, Lord, crash into their hearts. Open the eyes of the Taliban. <laughs> they need you. You are the answer. You loved them so much to die for them. Save them has been the prayer. And that's the same heart that God would have for our Muslim neighbors right here in the Fox Valley. Because a lot of them, if they know you're a Christian, they're like, yep, you Christian, you love those Jews. You hate me. That's how they view us, and that should be the last thing because we will be known by our love. Amen? Amen. So, Father, thank you for this study. We're excited to look into your preservation next week of your people of Israel and all the prophecies. Not all of them. We don't have the time, but it, it's so cool how, how you've been faithful to your word, Lord. And uh, just thank you for just teaching us this morning, God, just the purpose and the promises that you've given to Israel. And we pray for her this morning that you would, uh, yeah, that you would bring your peace. We know that you're the Prince of Peace. We know that you are literally going to stand on the Mount of Olives one day. You're going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Um, and we, we pray that you would come, Lord, because we know that's when ultimate peace will come uh, to Israel and the surrounding country, really this entire world. Uh, we need you, God. So please come. And we do pray for opportunities, whether it's a, a Jew, a Gentile, a Muslim, a Mormon, whoever, Lord. Uh, you've given us the words of life. God, you've saved us, Lord. That grace uh, <laughs> that we're saved by, Lord, we, we get to go share with others. We get to share that good news. Help us to do that well. Help us, help us to be salt and light for you. Thank you for how you love us, God. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.